Okay, well, yes, I intend to concentrate on what I call the British Imperial Zionists. That's to say, Lloyd George's wartime cabinet, which backed Balfour and his declaration in 1917. But just by way of introduction, I just want to mention Abby Schlein. Abby Schlein is a famous Israeli dissident historian at Oxford University, who, in my opinion, has written the very best essay on the Balfour Declaration. I think that's also at the back of the room. I'll give people a reference to the handbook. It's a very simple, short essay. It's very succinct, but he makes the most brilliant point. He just simply says, Britain seized Palestine from the Ottoman Empire during the war, took it, and gave it to another people. Didn't give it to the people who lived there, gave it to another people. What right, he asks, did they have to do that? And he underlines the extraordinary arrogance of this act. There's something else about Abi, just worth mentioning in passing. I called him an Israeli, actually he's an Iraqi Jew. I have no time to discuss this tonight. But the secondary victims, the primary victims of Balfour and Zionism are, of course, the Palestinians. The secondary victims are the Jews in Arab countries who were beginning to integrate very effectively, especially in Iraq at the beginning of the 20th century, and the Zionism polarized them apart. In other words, they were developing Arab Jews. Sounds a funny concept, that, but there really were thousands and thousands of Arab and Jewish people. Terribly important. If you want reconciliation, that's what we need to get back to. That's very much as an aside. Let me then now get into the nitty gritty, the arrogance that Abi Schlein described. If you saw around that very quirky program by Ian Hislop recently about the British took up the lid, you will have noticed one or two quite outstanding facts about the British Empire. That from Victoria's time to 1914, the expansion was absolutely massive. So Britain really did control more than half the world. So of course the British Empire took for granted the Holy Land should belong to them. I mean, this was the mentality. It was a crusader mentality in the 20th century. They took for granted they were going to take the Holy Land from the Turks in the First World War. Of course, it should belong to Britain. I mean, enough said. It was taken for granted. This is the greatest empire the world ever seen. It's very important to understand that's the mentality that drives the wartime cabinet. There are four villains, as far as I'm concerned. The four villains are Balfour, Lloyd George, Churchill. I'm sure you've heard of those three. And a particularly obnoxious diplomat called Mark Sykes. I'll come on to him in a moment, men have heard of him, though in a way it's just as important. Between them, they are, you, can, you can learn an enormous amount by understanding their political histories. And of course it's not just about grabbing the Holy Land, all four of them have an obsession with Jews. Now I take for granted, everybody understands that the British Empire's grab for Palestine was thoroughly anti-Arab. Thoroughly anti-Arab. I mean I haven't got time to go into it, but the famous British agent Lawrence of Arabia of course, it allegedly led the revolt of the Arabs against the Turks, was uniquely racist. I don't, I, the, the quotes from him about the Arabs are absolutely dreadful. A Churchill, becoming a Zionist, took for granted the Zionists should control Palestine because the Arabs had Palestine for thousands of years and couldn't grow anything in the desert. This was Churchill saying remarks like that. So I take for granted the anti-Arab racism of the leaders of the British Empire. What's less well understood is the anti-Jewish racism of the leaders of the British Empire. Their anti-Semitism is absolutely key. People assume Britain supported uh, the Jews and taking Palestine because they were so pro-Jewish. Not at all. It's much more interesting than that. They were anti-Jewish. Their motivation anti-Jewish. Let's take Balfour. Balfour, the Declaration. Balfour, that's in 1917. Balfour in 1905 had introduced something called the Aliens Act. The Aliens Act was expressly designed to keep Jewish migrants Getting out of, getting away from the pogroms in Eastern Europe, and Russia in particular, coming into Britain. It's a particularly vicious piece of anti migrant legislation. It's the foundation stone for the evolving anti migrant legislation right up until the present asylum seekers legislation. <coughs> On the other hand, 1917, Balfour apparently is a friend of the Jews. I always think of NIMBY, not in my backyard. Good old Balfour didn't want. Jews in Britain's backyard, he much preferred to stick them in the front garden of the Palestinians. And that's terribly important, this kind of redirection of Jewish migration. Cynical, vicious, and thoroughly racist. Balfour, by the way, was openly anti-Semitic. I mean, he used to boast, and he boasts in his diaries about his conversation with Cosby Wagner, the wife of the anti-Semitic composer of, uh, 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 of Wagner, and, and describes quite openly, he, he, he concurs with their uh, position and uh, attitudes towards uh, the Jews in Europe. So this is Balfour, thoroughly unpleasant, but it wasn't just Balfour. Let's move on to Lloyd George. I mean, they all profess uh, this kind of sentimentality, but it's a kind of, re they want, they want a reform program for the Jews, and how they say it. there's something wrong with the Jews, 
let's reform them by giving them Palestine. This, this, is, this is a theory, but with Lloyd George is something else. Completely bizarre, but Lloyd George was obsessed with Jewish power. Lloyd George was really worried about the wartime ally Russia in 1917 because the threat of what which of course occurred of the revolution. <coughs> the Russians pulling out of the wartime ally pact to make it easier for Germany. Lloyd George believed if he promised the Jews Palestine, the Jews of Russia, who were clearly controlling the revolution, would change sides and realize they're going to get their own country, would make them less enthusiastic for a revolution, therefore the revolution wouldn't happen, therefore Russia would stay on the side of the Brits. This may sound balmy, I do assure you, this was Lloyd George's position. It was completely nonsense, of course, because the revolution did indeed occur and Russia pulled out of the war. But nevertheless, it's a mentality, it's an obsession, in Lloyd George's case, with Jewish power. We move on to Churchill. Church had the same obsession. Church was particularly obsessed with Trotsky and the Russian Bolsheviks. He was certain, he used the phrase of Jewish conspiracy, the Russian Revolution of Jewish conspiracy, what we need, the Jews need their own country. Zionism will tame them down. Churchill spoke in these terms. Finally, Mark Sykes. Mark Sykes used to entertain himself. By the way, Mark Sykes, very important man. Um, part of a famous double act called sykes Pico. Some of you who followed the history of this will know about sykes Pico. Sykes was the principal British diplomat negotiating with the French, the two wartime allies that carved up the Middle East after the Ottoman Empire had been defeated. When Germany was defeated, the Turks went down. Sykes and Pico, on behalf of France and Britain, carved up, planned, before the, the Allied victory, planned to carve up the Middle East between France and Germany, between France and Britain, that was a land grab by British colonialism and French colonialism. Obviously, they quarrelled. There's a whole other story about how the Brits, Lloyd George, maneuvered with Sykes to avoid the French getting Palestine. But the important thing is, these two, these two diplomats played a very important role. Sykes was such an anti semite he used to uh, uh, have the hobby of drawing cartoons of Jewish finances with long hook noses. He thought that was very funny. He was also ultra Roman Catholic. He went to see the Pope and told the Pope, although I don't like Jews, if we get them into Palestine, it'll change their behaviour. So it's a kind of reform, a mad kind of reform programme that good old British imperialism, having grabbed the Holy Land, had for the Jews. Completely cynical. And of course, at the end of the day, it wasn't just about that. At the end of the day, it was also about a much more basic land grab and strategic concerns for the British Empire as it came out of World War I. Let's just talk about three of those strategic concerns. The idea being, I mean, Churchill talked about um, Palestine with a, with a Jewish population becoming like a little Jewish Ulster. That's quite a nice image. If you think about a little Jewish Ulster, Northern Ireland, being a tame British colony controlling the rest of Ireland. Churchill had this conception of a Jewish colony in Palestine, clearly having some control along with the British Empire, of course, as part of the object of the British Empire, controlling the rest of the Middle East. There are three strategically consider, consider considerations in terms of grabbing Palestine from, from the point of view for the military and economic concerns of the British Empire. The first one was the Suez Canal, because of course the Brits didn't just control Palestine, they, control, they didn't directly control Egypt, but they'd been behind the building of the Suez Canal at the end of the 19th century. The more, and the Suez Canal was absolutely central, a new vital artery for, 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 for shipping and trade and military hardware in general, absolutely key. And they took for granted the Suez Canal was really theirs. And in a sense, Egypt was simply a construction around the Suez Canal from the British point of view. And, uh, and, and having, having, having armed forces so close to the Suez was obviously incredibly important. If you think about Palestine, it's also more or less halfway between Britain and India. The Brits also saw it like that, they saw it as a staging post. Obviously, India is still the jewel in the crown. They saw Palestine and controlling Palestine as a strategically important uh, a part of their operation for hanging on to India after World War I. But there's a third and final point, which is Mesopotamia, what becomes Iraq. And the, the tapping of the oil, the oil supplies, comes on stream. And I'm conscious of the time, I'm going to fast forward from 1917 to 1936, where we come across good old Captain Wingate. Captain Wingate, who's, who's got a, who's got a, a, a British Jewish army unit, who's got mainly Jewish settlers in a British army unit, um, policing the oil pipeline that runs from Kirkuk in northern Iraq through to the port of Haifa. I mean, an absolutely explicit and open demonstration of the connection between British control of oil and the development of Zionist entity. Wingate, by the way, I mean, they're all British vicious, vicious uh, the army officers, but it was, it was uniquely vicious. I mean, many of the, uh, 
the activities that we now have to take for granted, tragically, with the Israeli Defence Forces, were actually developed by Wingate with Jewish settlers in army uniforms around that time. All the things that we're familiar with, blowing up houses, going into villages, having uh, impromptu trials, executions, harassing of families, breaking up of families, all of those things happened under the British uh, with Jewish settlers, as I say, British army uniforms, the Brits and together with the Zionist settlers, harassing and breaking the resistance of the Palestinians. Not just Wingate, good old Montgomery uh, came in from Ireland, having been defeated by the Irish insurgents. Montgomery came in, and we've got now the beginnings, by the way, in 1936, of, of, of the biggest revolt, actually, uh, uh, against the Balfour Declaration. That's probably the biggest revolt in, in, his, in, in Palestine's history. Montgomery was sent in to try to do something about it. The first thing Montgomery did was talk about caging, I repeat the word, caging Palestinians who wore the kafir, who wore the present kafir. In early those days, the symbol of the kafir from being terribly important and the vicious of the British army. It sparked this most massive revolt. And it's a revolt, I know God is going to talk about it. Sadly, this incredibly important, that means the largest, the biggest anti imperialist insurgency between the wars, it's still not been properly recorded. And that is a real tragedy, it's incredibly important. I just want to touch on, very, very superficially, on one or two aspects of it, because it's not fully understood. First of all, one really important point, that the, the Palestinian peasantry were incredibly well organised. One of the best books is a, is a series of interviews with, with old peasant fighters in the 1990s, who describe in detail the uh, state within a state. The fact that in the countryside, the British were having increasing difficulty getting into the countryside uh, 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 to, to do the patrols and to put down the revolt, so well organised with the press. I have some uh, quotes here, and I'm conscious of the time I want to read out the quotes. Uh, I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to one, one, one more minute. There's, there's one, I can get there. There's one quote I do want to give you. I'm actually going to end on this place. It's a wonderful old fighter, Palestinian fighter. Just bear with me for a second. It's a wonderful old Palestinian fighter called Ali Hussein Bata, and I'm really struck by him. He's doing an interview in the 1990s. The first thing he describes is he says he's a Muslim and a communist, and takes for granted you can be both. But he said that's absolutely really brilliant. Just takes it for granted, not Christian. Of course you could be both, he said in those days. Why not now? Secondly, before he does the interview, he insists on, if he does an interview with this journalist, the journalist has to promise to read out all the names of people who the Brits killed. And the journalist agrees, there's a huge list, and they're all in the man's head. He goes through the names, he remembers them after all these years. It's a condition for the interview. And the interview, and I'm going to finish on this quote, the interview is so shaken. After, this interview, after having done the interview with Ali Hussein, he says this about him. He said, we felt in awe of the fierce spirit burning so brightly in this diminutive man who repeated names of the dead as if the act itself could arrest the storm of progress. That's the resilience, and that resilience continues to this day. Thank you.